Welcome everyone to our Facebook Live today. Uh, we are going to be talking about uh, emotion regulation in children and the three R's. So I think with everything going on in the world, we see people more stressed out than ever. And this will hopefully make sense as to why that is. We all know we're going through a global pandemic, of course. However, um, what gets overlooked as you know, what part of the brain is impacted? How do we best help one another and our kids? And why doesn't certain, why don't certain techniques and strategies work? Maybe on our older child, but not on our younger child. Um, so hopefully this is going to make a, a lot more sense by the time we're done with our Facebook Live today. So this is really about the science of um, emotion regulation uh, and why our kids really struggle uh, depending on their age and uh, kind of their, their development. So I think the first thing to understand is how the brain develops and what happens when we become dysregulated because it really depends on the age of your child. So we love to talk about uh, Dr. Daniel Siegel's brain and hand model. Um, we're also bringing in some of the science um, from Dr. Bruce Perry amongst other um, world-renowned um, therapists and psychiatrists and researchers. So we'll, we'll start again with Dan uh, Siegel's uh, brain and hand model, and it looks and look at um, what we call bottom-up um, development. Um, so when we are born, if you think of this as uh, your, your brain, um, this would be your spinal cord, and then we have here, the palm of your hand here, would be your brain stem. And what I like to call the brain stem is the thinking part of your, or sorry, the uh, body brain. It controls the body. And then if we go in the middle with our thumb, this would be your emotional brain. Um, it's in charge of safety as well as relationships, emotion, and memory. And then if we put your fingers here, we get the cortical brain. And some people call a part of it, well, part of it is called the prefrontal cortex, but that's not the whole thing. The whole thing would be the cortical brain and your, your fingernail here would be the prefrontal cortex. And so we've got this, this development. So when we're born, the, the brain stem, which is in charge of your autonomic nervous system and your central nervous system is developed first. And so this is why we're able to, when we're born, we're able to see certain things. I mean, vision is the last kind of part to develop, but we have the ability for our hearts to, to pump blood and our lungs to breathe in air. Our immune system starts to function. So it's all the things that kind of go on autopilot in, in our body. And then within the first few months of being born, sometimes it takes a little bit longer depending on the child, we have that limbic system start to develop, the emotional brain. And that limbic system is in charge of connection and it's in charge of uh, keeping us safe and like formulating memories that exist. And then now every child's a little bit different, but that thinking brain up here, the cortical brain, doesn't really start to fill in those neural synapses, don't really start to fill in to about five to seven years of age. Now that doesn't mean some things don't happen between the time you're born and by the time you're five to seven, but there's not a lot of activity. It's very underdeveloped. So when we become, we're in a situation or your child's in a situation and they feel very overwhelmed, what happens is this information is collected by the brain stem. And that brain stem is going to look at the environment and it's going to send signals then from here up to your emotional brain. And that emotional brain, that limbic system, there's a part of it called the amygdala that's like the watchdog of your brain. And it's going to ask, is there something to be scared of? And if the answer is yes, or it seems threatening, maybe there's a memory because right next door to your amygdala, you have what's called a hippocampus, which is in charge of the autobiographical memory. It will go into there and pull a file that says, okay, yeah, this is a scary thing. And if that happens, it will, the, the, uh, the brain stem and the limbic system form like a feedback loop. And we have all these stress hormones that are released and we go into protection mode to keep us safe. And our default when we go into protection mode is one of four responses. We either want to run away, which is flight, we want to fight off an unseen enemy or a seen enemy, like we're, like we're getting attacked by a bear or a cougar. Uh, we might fight off a predator. Um, we have freeze, which is uh, we, we stop and we survey what's going on to look maybe for the nearest exit or decide the next plan. And then the fourth thing that we do is we can collapse. 
So one of the things I tell people is give this analogy of a gazelle hunting on, uh, that's grazing, sorry, on the savanna, and there is a lion. What's the first thing the gazelle does when it, it doesn't see the lion yet, but it hears maybe a rustling in the grass. Well, the first thing it's gonna do, it's gonna pop its head up, because that's usually what prey animals do first. So we're gonna go into um, a freeze response to survey. The heart starts beating, the, the stress hormones start being released, and then, but it doesn't quite act yet, but then it sees the lion, what does it do? It runs away, it goes into flight to try to get away. Now, if the lion captures the gazelle, it's gonna go into a fight response. It's gonna thrash, it's gonna kick, it's going to try to get away. And if that doesn't work, the last response, which most people don't understand or they don't know about, is the collapse response. It's the fawn response. It's the playing possum response. Uh, another word for it is dissociation and mental health. It's when your brain says, this is going to hurt too much that I can't be present for this. So your body goes into shock, you emotionally, psychologically check out, all these endorphins rush into your body so you don't feel the pain of being attacked, and you, you stop um, creating timestamp memory. There's all of these things that happens. We can call this, there's another word for it, is fragmentation of memory. And sometimes we think this, this adaptive response has come from um, playing possum too, where predators aren't supposed to eat things that are, are sick or, or dead. So the fawn response, that collapse response, may trick the lion into not eating it. And I'm sure it were, must have worked at some point in their evolution or they wouldn't do it. So when you become emotionally dysregulated, when that limbic system goes off, it's going to work with your brainstem to create a protection response. And so that protection response will be one of four things. And sometimes we start with one, and if it doesn't work, we go to the next one. And everybody is different in whether they will default to freeze or if they default to fight or to flight. And if you've had probably a lot of trauma, um, a lot of scary things happen to you, you might default right into collapse. So um, you may run through that kind of stages quite quickly. So every child's a little bit different. But ultimately, dysregulation of, of the body, of our brains, is all about fear. And it's all about protection. And the brain's number one thing it's designed to do, it can do some pretty amazing things, but the number one thing it's designed to do is to protect us. So when it's in protection mode, all bets are off. So when we think back to this brain, we have the body brain, the brain stem, the limbic system, and then if you put your fingers over top, you're going to have the thinking brain. Now the thinking brain, this cortical brain, is in charge of critical thinking, emotion regulation, empathy, problem solving, executive functioning. It's more, you know, it's, it's the, the part of your brain that has evolved more than any other mammals. So it's very unique to humans. But when we've got young children, this part of the brain is very, very underdeveloped. So they're mostly navigated by their limbic system and their brainstem. And even if you've got a child who's, say, 12 years of age, they're going to be a teenager, and we know we have that upstairs brain, that cortical brain developed, it's poorly developed, for one, because it's not done developing until close to 30 years of age. So I've got to remember that our ability to regulate our emotions isn't done till 30, and that's if everything goes well, because trauma can actually damage that part of the brain, which is why you can have a senior citizen or an older adult, like in their 50s, who can't regulate their emotions. Trauma really can, can stunt the growth of that part of the brain. But even with, let's say, your 12-year-old daughter has been bullied at school, and she comes home, and she's crying and upset, in those tough moments, she is in her limbic system and what it does is it cuts off connectivity during big feelings to the thinking brain so we see that communication is stunted so your teenage daughter's ability to use critical thinking to understand what happened and understand the sequence events to calm herself down is often eradicated for the time being and so i think that's important to know about kids is when they're having a tantrum, and depending how old they are, they're, and, and even if you've got a two-year-old or if you've got a, you know, an 18-year-old, during hard moments of dysregulation, they're in their limbic system and brainstem. They're not using this part of the brain yet. That part of the brain eventually comes online, but this is the thing. In order for us to use this upstairs brain here, to because it's in charge of critical thinking, but it's also in charge, and logic, but it's also in charge of emotion regulation self-regulation 
we need to practice a skill set before the child's ready to do that. And that is co-regulation, where an adult joins the child in their limbic system response and uses their calm, their groundedness to, to help bring peace to the child through the attachment relationship. As we walk that path with our kids over and over and over, their brain eventually learns as that upstairs brain develops how to calm themselves down. But first they have to be regulated with an adult who is safe. So this brings me to what we call are the three R's. When we are trying to calm a child down, we have to understand that when they're in their limbic brainstem, limbic system and brainstem, the circular loop of, of protection, a fight, flight, freeze, collapse, they can't reason with, you can't reason with them. It's very, very difficult with children. So what we have to do is start from the bottom and work our way up. Now, so the brain stem, what it needs in order to stay regulated is, like I said, regulation, which is, so to stay regulated, we use our word R, it's regulation. It needs consistency, predictability, and rhythm. So if we think of having, think of an infant when they're first born, really they're navigated solely by their brain stem. They need to be rocked, they need routine and bedtimes. They need consistency from mom and dad. Um, they need this, this predictability that exists in terms of reactions from, from other people. They need to know what to expect. So the first thing we always attune to with our children, we ask, why are they always kind of losing their mind? We said, well, I wonder if they're, they're, I think something has been disrupted in their environment that they can't predict what's happening next. Um, the brainstem also needs for regulation. It needs good food. It needs sleep. It needs rest. It needs play. The child needs to move. So there's all of these things that the brainstem needs. So during difficult moments, we want to be able to say that the environment is safe for this child. There's no loud noises. We are calm in our demeanor. We've, we've created an environment that is safe for that child. So that's the first thing we do. We go to the brainstem and we regulate the brainstem, which is creating, again, that consistent, predictable, rhythmic environment. Then we need to then regulate what's formed next in the brain is the limbic system. And the limbic system needs relationship. So the second R is relate. So what that is about is the child being co-regulated. The child has to feel like they belong, that nothing can separate them from their parents' love. There's this being seen and being heard. So that attachment relationship is really what brings calm to that limbic system. How do we do that? It, well, first, like we brought into the brainstem, we need to share our calm with our child, not join them in their chaos. So that means we have to take really big deep breaths. We might have to give ourselves a timeout, not our child, us, to just bring ourselves into center, remind ourselves that my child doesn't have access to their thinking brain right now. I have to be their calm, not the storm that makes it worse. So you've got to be that safe harbor for your child. We need to give safe touch to our children. This will help. Name the emotion they're feeling. So Dr. Dan Siegel and Dr. Tina Payne Bryson would say name it to tame it. This not only connects with your, with your emotional brain, it also connects with the hemisphere, the right hemisphere of the brain that is overactivated when, when we, flip, you know, we flip our lid and we go into that protection response. So that is the next step, is we want our kids to feel like they have a harbor that they can relax into and we co-regulate them. So that's the next step. We don't talk, we don't use a lot of words because the, it's the upstairs brain, it's this cortical brain and also the left hemisphere that likes to reason and talk. Our kids don't have access to that when they are in a full meltdown. They need connection and they need predictability from you. They need that safety. And then once we can deactivate the brainstem and the, it's really the amygdala, that watchdog in the limbic system, then we can move to the last R, which is about reasoning. Now, if you've got really little ones, you don't really have to worry about the step as much because that part of the brain hasn't filled in a lot yet. So we're not going to worry too much about teaching. Um, the best thing you can do with really young kids is just set limits so they understand what is appropriate, what's not, and give some choices. But once we have kids, you know, who are around that uh, six, seven, eight, nine, we can start doing some of this reasoning. This is about teaching children and problem solving and saying, I wonder what we could do different next time. 
This is also important that kids feel heard before they're receptive to this. So you still have to make sure that we use our active listening skills, understand their point of view before we go on and lecture them about what they should have done. And this is always best using reasoning, reasoning is through collaborative problem solving and, and solving this issue together. This is where your discipline can come in too, where we, we bring on strategies like making it right, where the child and you can talk about the impact that they had on someone else, why that behavior wasn't okay, and what do they need to do to rectify the situation. But we don't do any of that, that reasoning part, that, that third R, until we've taken care of the relationship and the regulation of the body. Um, so those are, that's kind of the order in which we, we focus on emotion regulation. Start from the bottom, which is the brainstem and creating safety. That's your re regulation. Then we are going to move to the limbic system, the emotional brain, and we are going to work on, on uh, relationships. So we're going to relate and we're going to validate and we're going to use safety and proximity and co-regulation. And then when the child is calm, we can move into reasoning Again, for usually kids who um, are, are past the preschool toddler stage, we wouldn't use a lot of that. And this is about, you know, this teaching the skill set, which happens around, you know, six or seven, we can start doing this. But again, we only go into teaching mode, into reasoning mode when the child is feeling connected to us and is feeling calm. So that's our, our Facebook Live about um, the emotion regulation uh, and, and using the three R's to understand emotion regulation. We actually have a course coming up on fostering emotion regulation. You can go to our Facebook page and look under events. It will be in March and I will be spending an entire day with the audience teaching them about skills actually related to each one of these three R's that we can use to calm not only the brainstem, the limbic system, but also the cortical brain and what are some concrete strategies that we can use to do that. So I hope you can join, join us in March. Check it out uh, on our events on our Facebook page and I hope everyone has a great day.